So let's get started. So this is going to be, again, uh, a, a weekly uh, series on, on design principles. There's going to be one principle, one new principle every week. Uh, I'm not going to tell which principle uh, it is going to be. Uh, so there's a bit of a, an element of surprise that hopefully you're going to find exciting and a reason to come back for, for more. So, so let's get started. And again, if you are new also to the interface, um, there is uh, um, a pool at the very bottom that you can answer. I would very much appreciate if you could do that, just to get a sense of your background and where you're coming from. Uh, and also, if you have questions along the way, just ask me a question. And uh, there is a, a little widget on the bottom of the screen saying, ask a question. And I'm going to try to address a couple of those towards the end of this short live session on design principles. So stay tuned for more. So I think all of us have been faced with this uh, dilemma of having to justify a design decision, right? This could be in a design review, you know, facing a client, a stakeholder, or whatever the context might be. And I think the worst approach you can have is one where you rely on your own personal opinion to defend a given solution, right? You should really avoid that at all costs. You know, things like, well, I believe, I think, in my opinion, this looks better or this is a better solution. Right? Just try to avoid that as much as, as possible. And for me, I think we can all learn immensely. Uh, uh, there's numerous insights coming from the areas of cognitive science and behavioral science, right? specifically the areas of attention, perception, memory, and emotion. And through this weekly series, I think the effort, the joint effort for me and for you in the audience is for really us to convert cognitive behaviors into design principles that can be used and applied not only on user experience, but graphic design, data visualization, and many other fields. So in many ways, I really want to empower you with this creative toolbox that then you can use in your own practice. And this toolbox is gonna to be made of principles. So I love the notion of a principle because it gives you a general idea or a plan but in a not very specific or prescriptive way. And this is a really important part of the principle. It's a high level plan or idea or concept, right? It will never tell you exactly all the steps you need to do to achieve uh, a given solution, right? It expresses this fundamental quality or nature of something. So our first weekly principle is Hicks Law. It's one of my favorites, and it's really all about organizing information. And we're going to go through more in coming weeks. But in first week, I have to start with X Law. X Law is named after British psychologist uh, William Hick, uh, and uh, who actually was a pioneer in, in many of these new sciences of experimental psychology. And he came up with this rule that says that the time it takes to make a decision increases as the number of alternatives increases, right? This is a super, super important principle on design. This is also known as the paradox of choice, right? There's actually a book by the same name, uh, The Paradox of Choice, which I highly encourage you to, to buy and read if you haven't already. Now, what does that mean, the paradox of choice, right? X law. Well, I think all of us have faced this in, in many different ways, right? Just by going into a restaurant where there's this humongous menu of options. I love this one. I took this one from the web. I mean, I actually counted. There's like 36 types of omelets you can choose in this specific restaurant. I mean, talk about being overwhelmed with the amount of options, right? 36 types of omelet. But think about, I mean, in a very simple way, think about this, right? Let's say that you are at a restaurant and you are feeling like getting fruit in the end of a meal, right? And you ask the waitress, hey, you know, what, do you have any fruits? What kind of fruits do you have? And, you know, they say, well, we have only a couple oranges and bananas, right? That's it. You might as well just pick one or that's it. Maybe you pass on dessert because you're really not feeling anything else. Now imagine if instead that, wait, that same waitress gives you a long list of 10 or 12 possibilities, right? From oranges to strawberries to pineapple to, to pears, peaches, etc. It's pretty daunting, right? I mean, just that exercise alone, you can see how this plays in your head, right? So not only is it hard for you to memorize every single option, 
but it increases the time for you to make a decision because now we have more things to, to, to balance, right? To deliberate on. So this is really Hicks law in principle. Now, we have all faced this in other ways. You know, many times we go into a supermarket. I face this all the time, actually, here in, in going to, a, to my, you know, uh, be a, around the corner supermarket. Sometimes I just want plain yellow mustard. But all of a sudden, I go into this aisle and there's like, 20 different types of mustard, you know, with uh, with honey, with uh, maple syrup, with crunchy something. I don't want, I just want, I don't, I just want the yellow mustard, okay? So the anxiety that is, is produced through that experience alone is pretty daunting, right? That's really Hicks Law. And it creates a lot of stress on people. Uh, not just some supermarkets. I mean, every kind of, of, of purchasing decision we make today in these modern times is anxiety inducing, right? From picking a pillow, right? To picking a new pair of, of running shoes, to picking a new TV. I mean, you have to do a countless hours of research, <laughs> which is lame, it's so crazy. Uh, you spend so much time doing research on choosing sometimes a really simple item like mustard or a pillow, right? It's, things should be easier to pick, right? Not making things more complex for the user. And I think this is really the one of the, the biggest paradoxes of modern times is, you know, this desire for more options, this idea that we are empowered by the freedom we have to choose what we want, right? And we forget at times that that freedom comes at a cost. And the cost normally is comes in terms of anxiety, in terms of stress. And I think a Danish uh, philosopher says this in the best possible way when he mentions that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom, right? I think it really expresses this, this paradox, this conundrum of, of modern times. But as you, as you might actually know, more is not always better. Uh, I love this study. This was actually done in 2000, 20 years ago by a couple of psychologists. And what they did is that they actually went into a supermarket and one day they put up a display selling jams. But in the first day, they were selling 24 different types of jams, okay? And then the same experiment this following day, but in that day, the second day, they only had six types of jams, so a much smaller number, as you can imagine, right? Now, on the first day, they got a lot more interaction. People were really interested in tasting all these crazy flavors and, and, and so on. But now, when it came to conversion, right, to actually making a purchasing decision, only 3% bought jam in the first day versus 30% in the second day with sick jams, right? So this is one of many examples that more is not always better. And this is a very kind of fallacy that we many times fall by assuming that more is better. And more is better, that, that fallacy when it comes to user interface comes into a number of features, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So how does that translate? Well, it translates in many different ways when it comes to, to user experience and, and user interface. The one on the left is the common sitemap. I think all of us have went to a sitemap, and I should remind you that a sitemap is actually made to help guide the users through process, right? And instead, they provide you with a kitchen sink, right? They throw everything and they have <laughs> in the website and outside of the website in, in front of the user. So it's immensely overwhelming, the number of options, and it leads to paralysis, right? Or even Craigslist. Craigslist is an okay tool once you got used to it, but for a first time user is immensely overwhelming. Again, by X law, right? The number of options and the time it takes to actually make a decision on something and even looking for something in that in this particular interface. Another common bad practice is having too many calls to action on your page, right? This is a really a great example of X law, right? The example on the left says, is really calling for users' attention in numerous ways, right? There's multiple CTAs, uh, calls to action. There's learn more, help me choose, start here. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm confused, like which one should I actually click? Everyone is screaming for attention, right? Everything is screaming to be clicked on. And that can be leading to paralysis as well. Or even the settings page that you see on the right side. <laughs> I was actually, I don't go, you know, in, in recent times, I don't actually use Facebook that often, mostly for the pages that I, that I manage there. And I went to the settings uh, for whatever reason, and I discovered this tremendously complex page. 
Like every single thing that you see there is clickable. And this almost seems like a dark pattern. It's almost like complex by default, by design, so that people never change whatever default settings that they might have, right? It, this is really bad practice. This is so overwhelming that it just leads to paralysis. You just, you know, I, I'm just going to close that page. I'm not even going to bother changing whatever settings I was looking for. And this is a really important practice that we actually uh, play at Google all the time. And we we use this, this is somehow of an anonymous quote that we we use all the time, that when everything is important, nothing is. And I think that's a really important uh, sort of maxim that we take to heart, right? It also applies, this principle, of course, also applies equally to, uh, to data visualization, right? Examples like this make it tremendously hard to, of course, understand, first of all, what's going on, but also interact and consume that information. Where do I start? Like, what is the starting point? What is, what should I be clicking on or interacting with or consuming, right? It's really, it makes it tremendously hard. The example on the left, of course, <laughs> is the, the famous uh, healthcare system map that has been criticized by so many, uh, I think, over the years. And then, of course, on the right, you have a network visualization, which is always suffers from this, mostly because they really deal with tremendously hard and complex topics to, to pick. Uh, and it makes it extremely hard. You know, it really is X law in practice. Many of these examples, many of these airball type of examples are X law in practice because you don't really know where to start. You don't know what to choose, what to interact with. Or even sometimes even a simple line chart when you have too many series, and believe me, the example on the left is not even some of the worst that I've seen, uh, is immensely complicated. It kind of reminds me of this Mikado game. I don't know if you guys have played it in the past. Like when I grew up, when I was a kid, I, we actually played Mikado, this pick up sticks game all the time. And every time I see a, a line chart like this, I, I think about Mikado, right? It's that the fear of like touching something else in the process of getting to the stick that I want or the line series that I want, right? It's this, it's a fear inducing sort of mechanism, right? Many of these charts, because again, like not just it's, they are not just only really hard to understand and read, but they're also immensely hard to interact because it's again, where do you start, right? So Mikado, I use that as a really good metaphor to explain the challenges of some of these charts as well. But not, not all is lost. You know, X law really shows us that too many options and, 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 and more is not always better, right? But there are actually really interesting design techniques and method, methodologies that we can apply. And in the following weeks, we're gonna cover many of them. One of them is the notion of highlighting that can really sort of bring to light a specific aspect of the UI or the data visualization example that you have. Progressive disclosure, the same thing. Uh, it, this is a really common technique, both in interaction design and data visualization as a way of minimizing complexity, right? And the 80-20 rule that we're gonna cover in, in uh, possibly even next week, uh, but in weeks to come for sure, uh, which is all about understanding what are the top features? What is the top 20% of your features? And highlight those, make those prominent in a more effective way. And other related principles on the, the notion of organizing information are, of course, analysis paralysis, right? This is really like almost a symboling to X law, right? Uh, that you become paralyzed by choice, that you become paralyzed by overanalyzing something. We also, at some, at some point in the future, we're going to cover Orovacui in detail. This is uh, really the, the fear that it's a, it's a bias that many of us have, humans, a bias for empty space. Right, uh, but we're also going to talk about why white space is so important in most design experiences, and of course, finally, the signal to noise ratio, another another symboling of Higgs law, right? The importance of maximizing signal and decreasing noise at all costs. Now, if you haven't uh, already, uh, again, not only we will cover many of these principles in detail in coming weeks, but if you haven't already. Please take a look at this Wikipedia page. It's arguably one of my favorite Wikipedia pages uh, ever. Uh, and I actually use it on a regular basis. It's called the list of cognitive biases. And many of the principles that 
I will eventually talk about are actually featured here. And some are not because they don't reply to design as clearly. But this is really a list of cognitive biases that you really understand uh, how the brain, the human brain operates. So I really encourage you to do, to, list, to see this list uh, when, when you can. And this is it. This is, again, the goal of this is not to be a lengthy webinar. This is a short snippet. This is an appetizer, if you want, or for you to actually dig deeper into some of these principles and, and get acquainted with, uh, with some of the rules and laws that are implied uh, on, this, on some of these principles. So if you haven't already followed me on, on Twitter, this is probably the best way to actually be uh, notified of future events of, like this. Again, this is going to be a weekly series. Uh, you can also, again, my Twitter tag is, is MSLima. You can, of course, also follow me here on Crowdcast. Uh, and if you are on the call right now, of course, just use the little green button on the very top that you see follow. And you're going to be able to be notified once an event goes live, like this one, every week. That's probably the best way. You're just going to get an email as soon as the event goes live. And you can just jump on the call, as, as many of you have probably done today, actually. So yeah, follow me on Twitter or Crowdcast to be notified of future events. This is going to be, again, a weekly series. This is, these are short snippets on design principles. And there's many more to come. So now. I would love to take uh, questions from the audience, uh, if there are, uh, either by using the chat or using the little ask a question that you see on the, on the very bottom. I might actually post the recording also on YouTube. That's a great question. I, I think I will. Uh, that Marco is asking if this recording will be posted on YouTube. It will be, of course, available as a recording, all of these uh, series of talks for those who are now on the call, right? Like by using the same link, you can just jump straight into the into the, the recording after this event is closed. But I actually will probably post it on, on YouTube as well. Well, OK, so we have a few questions here. Uh, I'm, I'm just reading through the comments, so please allow me to do that. So there's a, a few here asking questions and comments. Um, so Vemzi mentioned the TV remote. Yes, the TV remote, I'm actually saving that example for a future principle, which is called the flexibility usability trade-off. It's by far one of my favorite principles, and we're going to talk about that in detail in, in coming weeks. Well, great. Thanks. I'm happy. Uh, better. Uh, what's the name of the channel on YouTube? Uh, the channel on YouTube, I, I can actually send you an email. Uh, Natalie is asking about what's the name of the channel on YouTube. I will um, I will send you an email after this session uh, and, and with a link to the YouTube video, and then you can actually check the, the channel as well. I've been posting, I, I posted a conversation on historical data visualization uh, that I think happened two weeks ago. I just posted it this week on YouTube, so that's already available for everyone to, to see. Yes. Uh, so Zainab asks, if all the design principles you will be speaking on, are we going to be based on different cognitive biases? Most will, and I think that's, again, an endless source of inspiration for design, and I think Cognitive science and behavioral science are unfortunately not really mentioned or even thought in many design programs in schools. And I think that's really a pity. Um, and this is meant to actually solve that gap in many ways. Some design principles are not completely uh, directly related with cognitive science or psychology, but I would say the vast majority will be. Will you inform us of more webinars on LinkedIn? Yes, absolutely. 
All right, so there's a couple more questions here. Do you have any recommendations of books on cognitive biases? Yes, absolutely. So if there is one book that I could, I could really recommend, it's called The Universal Principles of Design. Uh, it actually encompasses many of the principles we're going to be talking about. I'm just going to add more flavor, more color, and more specific examples. But that book is tremendously helpful. I think this is really the starting point for anyone doing research in this area. Universal principles of design. How do you find design for emotions? You mentioned that earlier. How do you design for emotions? That's a, that's a great point. Uh, Joan is asking, uh, how do you design for emotions? You mentioned that earlier. Yes. So I think there's actually going to be a couple of, of, of principles uh, down the line where we're going to talk specifically about that, the role of emotion in, in understanding uh, a specific design solution or making it more understandable through emotion, right? So more to come on that, Joan. Often as designers, we need to present all the available options to the user. How do we handle the situation? Well, it's really a dance, Bamzin. I think, again, like, it's it, it goes back to the to the kitchen sink approach right more is not always better and in fact i think it all comes down to respect right respect for the user respect of that time respect of that mental uh, space you know uh, cognitive load if you take respect as the guiding principle in all of this you will soon realize that too many options are actually not the right way to to go in most cases right because in many of, the, of these decisions, users want to be guided along the way, right? And if you just show everything that you have and more on the page, you're doing the opposite. And it can actually, uh, scares, it can actually scare them. Again, going back to the jam example, uh, out of those 24 uh, different types of jam, only 3% actually got to purchase uh, one of those, right? Uh, so the conversion was, was really poor. And this is, you know, exactly the opposite of what you might think that more is better. Okay. So again, I think this is also a dance. Many designers are not doing work in isolation. They are doing work in a team, you know, sometimes with an engineer team, with, with a PM or a PM team. So there's, there's really a lot of people that you have to talk to. And, and of course, especially if you are doing horizontal work across multiple teams, I think everyone has a tendency to like want to have their feature prominent or, or included in whatever experience you're creating. So it is a bit of a give and take conversation that you have to have with those people. And everyone on the team needs to realize that again, more is not always better, right? And, and again, using, I think all, for all of us on the call is using X law as an example when you have those discussions, right? And, and not just X law, but there's many other principles we're gonna cover such as the 80-20 rule, right? Analysis paralysis. There's going to be other principles we're going to cover that can help you in that conversation. In order to persuade clients, do you have more business examples of companies doing better after removing choices of web services apps? That's a great question, Sergey. Uh, I don't actually have it right now, but I think in coming principles, that, that could actually be something that I should add to some of the slides, right? With tangible examples from companies that have either suffered from not adopting a given principle or have succeeded by adopting a principle, right? So that's a great suggestion. Uh, thanks a lot for that. I, I might do that in, in, coming, in coming sessions in the future. So I think I just answered most of the questions. This apparently takes a little bit more than, I think initially I was thinking about 10 minutes. I was definitely a, a bit naive. Uh, it's taking roughly 30 minutes, which is still, you know, it feels like a good format, better than like a lengthy webinar. But so I'm gonna aim aim at 20 to 25 minutes next time. But but thank you all for for joining. Uh, there's a couple more question here from Ahmed saying, will the evolution of database language principles and all the other webinars be available on YouTube? I might actually do that, Ahmed. I'm thinking about doing that. Uh, so. Give me some time. I think some of these I will definitely post on YouTube. I'm still debating whether or not I should put all of them. So I, I still need to plan and try to also find time to do so. <laughs> uh, not it's a, it's a tough time for I guess everyone. So, but I really I really appreciate your time. I really uh, welcome you to future sessions that we're gonna do. Uh, and again, uh, stay stay. Stay safe. I think that's really the most important thing, you know, you and your family. 
uh, these are really tough times and I hope everyone is doing okay. And if nothing else, I hope this was a bit of a distraction from the mundane, from the, the grim news that we see all the time. So, so I really appreciate your time and join me next week, uh, next Wednesday, around the same time. I'm gonna post it on Twitter and LinkedIn with updates, so you can follow me there. And um, and I'm and next time I'm actually gonna try to do this Periscope thing and see if that works. I tried it today, it didn't work. So next time will be second charm. Second time will be charm. Hopefully it's not gonna be the third time. So hang in there. All right. Well, thank you everyone. It was a pleasure as always. Thanks for making the time and design principles. More to come. See you.